Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Pukekawa te maunga, ko Watamata te moana, ko te ako, te tui, te awa, ko Tamaki Pāngehera, te whare, no Brighton Aho, ko Ben Bradford toko ingawa, no rewa tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, I'm Ben Bradford, I am the digital experience producer at Auckland War Memorial Museum and previously I was the content and interpretation developer or the exhibition developer on the project that we're going to be talking to you about today, Pokanohi New Zealand at War. Uh, this is our newest permanent gallery, part of the museum's World War I centenary commemorations, and it's also our first gallery dedicated to formal learners, uh, specifically school years 5 to 13. That meant that in development we work closely with teachers to understand the needs of the students coming to the gallery, and it's for this reason that we aspire to create a highly interactive exhibition with a suite of digital experiences to suit different learning styles. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko nai ko hatu wha kirikiri kā o tamatia pukai whenua ti maunga. Uh, ko tamaki pange here at whari, no ototahi ahau, ko gai anan toka wingua, no rewa tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Uh, kia ora, I'm Guy, uh, Digital Experience Manager at Auckland Museum. Uh, before working at the museum, I was actually a supplier uh, for the Paul Kanuhi uh, Gallery and got the awesome opportunity to be part of the Auckland Museum team earlier this year. Uh, my involvement over the past year with this gallery has been placing in analytics to help inform how we might optimise these interactives. So this is a look inside the gallery, for those of you that haven't seen it. Um, here we're looking at the chronology, which is uh, very much the centrepiece of the gallery. It's intended to be a layman's guide to some of the key events from the First World War, often through a New Zealand lens. Uh, this is comprised of archival images, graphics and collection objects. Um, you can see it's a pretty bright and vibrant space. There's an interplay between the restored heritage architecture of our 1929 building and the new exhibition fit-out. A lot of that colour coming through is also from some of the graphic artwork you can see, uh, which we commissioned for the gallery, uh, and was illustrated with great attention to detail and extensive research by the artist. The decision to use illustrations interspersed through the historical imagery was one of the decisions we made working with that focus group of teachers. Um, we wanted to engage students of the target audience in ways they perhaps weren't expecting in the museum. Um, so that was our aspiration for developing this highly interactive gallery, um, which has got a fair bit of digital in it, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and just to give you a better sense of that, we're just going to show you the following clip. more than that just being a very slick piece of marketing. Uh, we wanted to show you that clip as it really does give you a good overview of the wide range of experiences that are in the gallery. Amongst the large number of collection objects, display cases, physical interactives and films that were commissioned for the gallery, we developed five bespoke digital experiences with around 15 screens and outputs, partnering with three external developers. Uh, we're just going to look at each of these in turn and then touch on a couple in a bit more detail. Uh, Letters from the Frontline was our flagship experience offering access to a newly curated set of primary source material in the form of World War I letters from our collection, which students are able to save and reference for their projects, which Guy's going to talk to in a bit more detail. David Araya's flask, one of our hero objects, a flask beautifully engraved by Private David Araya of the New Zealand Pioneer Battalion. This interactive offers 360 degree interaction with a 3D model of the flask where visitors can access more information about the battalion's involvement at the locations listed, and also listen to quite moving audio interviews with David Araya's Mokopuna, Anet Tiwehi Takere. 
Uh, aerial reconnaissance is one of the experiences I'm going to talk to a bit more. Um, visitors can use these two multi-taction tables which allow visitors to pilot aircraft high above the trenches of the Western Front to gather intelligence photographs. The digital chronology allows visitors to view the events from the timeline in front of them, either via a timeline or a map view, and provides more information on these through extended labels, along with images, beautiful object photography of the collections on display, um, and other collateral images. And that's something else that they can save, which again, Guy's gonna speak to. And finally, the VR experience. Um, it places you in a gun battery emplacement alongside a QF 18-pounder field gun loosely approximated on the one in the museum's collection. So that's the five bespoke experiences. Just going to touch on a couple of them. There is a lot of digital in this gallery, and we don't have time to cover all of it. So we're just going to touch on some of the ones that have got the most unique experiences for visitors and that have given us lots of key learnings. Um, so first up, the aerial reconnaissance room. Um, we developed this with Flightless and recently won a gold best award in the interactive category. It's in this small annex room at the back of the gallery, which is great as it creates this sort of war room look and feel. It's quite dimly lit in there, and there's these wonderful graphics on the wall. Uh, the rationale behind the concept and the content, uh, we really wanted to feature aircraft in the gallery as part of a section looking at new technologies and the advancement of weaponry in World War I. Aircraft are a big part of that story, and we thought it was a great opportunity to include a game in the experience, but we knew we didn't want to just have kids dogfighting and shooting each other down. We felt it was probably inappropriate in the exhibition, which is adjacent to our memorial galleries, but also, honestly, we probably didn't want to compete with the highly realistic war games that these kids are playing at home. And frankly, they do enough shooting of each other at home. You know? um, so we wanted to encourage visitors to think a step before the dogfighting commenced. Why were these aircraft suddenly in the skies over battlefields? And we developed this experience centered on aerial reconnaissance. This involved creating a bespoke, fictionalized landscape of a, a typical Western Front trench network um, I say fictionalised because it's got a, you know unusually high concentration of targets to find, such as ammo dumps, railway stations and supply networks. Um, the key learning of this experience, particularly for our younger users, is quite simple to us, but really isn't worth overstating to them. There's no satellites, there's no Google Earth. A uh, hundred years ago, in this war of attrition with trenches deadlocked and movement extremely limited, the only way to find out what was going on behind enemy lines was to put a plane in the air with a pilot, an observer and an unwieldy camera. Uh, it's a dangerous undertaking, and placing this seemingly obvious yet often overlooked fact at the centre of this experience really has surprised some of our younger visitors. Um, key learnings for us from the experience, besides a few detailed UX problems to solve with the controllers, which you can see on the bottom right, um, the speed of the planes and a few other little things, there were a couple of clear takeaways. One was to include some Easter eggs, because uh, for all of that work of not wanting to let the kids shoot at one, in one another, we didn't overlook the industriousness of the average 10-year-old who obviously just wants to crash the planes together as quickly as possible. So we work to include some smoke and spark and bangs when they do that, which they do. Uh, but the main learning for us um, was in putting this game together we, and trying to dis, you know, make ourselves distinct from the games they're playing at home, we obviously wanted to try and impart some knowledge and some learnings here. And so once you've gathered all of your reconnaissance photographs, you're transported to an intelligence briefing um, where you can see information on the type of targets that you've uncovered on your flight. However, that glaring play again button is just too irresistible to the young visitor who's just had their first thrill as an aviator and they don't want to read any copy. So at the end of the experience, they don't engage with the content, it's bam, play again. So in any game within a museum context when we're trying to sneak learning in, I think it's really wise to move away from this play complete reward model where the information's all kind of dumped in at the end. And instead we want to work to sort of see the information throughout or actually make it integral to the completion of the task at hand itself. Um, our virtual reality experience. The initial concept here was simply to include the 18-pounder field gun from our collection within our section looking at the evolution of firearms in the build-up to and during World War I. Um, in the gallery, we have weapons on display from muzzle-loaded muskets through to rifles and machine guns that chart the advancement of weaponry in a very short space of time, resulting in the catastrophic and unprecedented casualty rates of the war. However, it's artillery shells that inflicted the greatest injuries and loss of life in the war, and we needed to include that in our display. Um, there just wasn't enough space to bring this weapon into the gallery. So we decided to do this. We scanned, modelled and rendered the gun from our collection, um, and we elected to display it in a dynamic setting, again enlisting our graphic artist to draw the six-man gun crew to show the scale of the weapon and the individual role of each gunner. We built an immersive 360 environment and soundscape, complete with airplanes flying overhead and shells exploding on the horizon, um, this graphic here shows you a little bit of the build. Um, the one limitation really is that 
you're not able to move around the landscape yourself as we probably initially um, expected or wanted to do. Um, you're on a fixed point, although you can look around you 360 degrees. And this is the type of thing you see when you're wearing the headset. And if I was giving a really honest critique of something that I worked very closely and very hard on, I worry that we essentially ended up with a glorified label. Although it's great to see the gun crew in action and there's a lot of action kind of going on, there's a lot of text here to take in. Um, the label refreshes to a new fact about the gun every few seconds, such as the range of the gun, interpreted for our target audience by stating that it could fire from the museum to One Tree Hill and things like that. Um, we could have lost a lot of this text and used audio description. The experience does have audio. Um, there's audio of the shouts of the gun crew, explosions on the horizon and planes. Um, but we were worried about the earphones breaking and depriving the visitor of that key information, which was a good call because the earphones break all the time. Um, so all up, this was a fairly resource-intensive experience to develop, and that's probably truest for the hardware. Um, the headsets are unsupervised, with no permanent visitor host in the space. The, headset, uh, the headsets are often broken, wires pulled, the sensor is jabbed like a button, and it breaks my heart to walk past it and seeing the sorry I'm not working label attached, but it does happen. Um, but the VR has been a massively popular experience with our target audience, and they absolutely flock to it. Um, one thing that VR is capable of doing really well in an exhibition is maintaining the element of surprise. You don't know what's inside until you put the headset on. Um, this is something I'm going to touch on a little bit later, but I'm going to shut up for a minute and let Guy say something. Kia ora, Ben. I'll give you a bit of a break. Thanks for that, mate. Um, collectible content. Righty ho. Um, so you might have actually remember uh, this was kicked off last year by Nils, Reverend Nils's. Shout out to Nils. Um, and here we are, here we are, mate, a year later. Some learning is in the, and some insights on how it's been going. Now, the purpose of collectible content, or my collection, uh, was to provide formal learners um, a way to gather content quickly throughout the gallery, uh, meaning students had more time to look at objects rather than lots and lots of text. This was a pilot, and it's still running. Um, and in a nutshell, it gave the ability for students or the general public to save content that interested them via a my collection card. Just to talk through this process in a bit more detail, there is this red kiosk, uh, and it's at the last 1918 chronology wall, uh, interactive, sorry, that would dispense the My Collection cards. The visitor gets the card, which has a unique identifier and a QR code on the back. Visitors could then go and save content from any of the chronology and letters interactives, so it's 11 interactives in total. And when the visitor is using interactive and they find a piece of content that they would like to capture and read more about later, for example, this piece of content here, uh, a letter that Lieutenant Harry Danzy often wrote to his sweetheart, Pat. Uh, this is the symbol with the infrared scanner next to the interactive, as you can see on the right-hand side there. They place the card under the scanner and the interactive then, then prompts them uh, to place in their email address. If you did miss the card kiosk, you could also save content from the interactive without it. Uh, there is a save content call to action on pieces of content where you can place in your email address to collect the content directly. And the final step of this process is we, um, the content gets sent to a visitor's unique web landing page identified with their card. We also email them so they have that unique link on their account for the future. So this is a generic top-level analytics for this experience. Now, the data that was collected from the 8th of March from the 8th of October as analytics for interactives were not actually set up when the gallery launched, which is another lesson that I'll touch on later. Um, so over a seven-month period, we have over, have over 16,000 saves, and this was across 292 pieces of content. Most frequently saved letter, uh, a call to all single men, 470 saves, having over 1,700 page views. Despite the large amount of traffic to this letter, uh, it may not be actually representative of its popularity, as this letter was more readily accessible than others. It's further up on the user journey, which makes sense. Uh, overall, this letter comprised of only 3% of all visitor saves. So this demonstrates that visitors are selecting a wide range of content to save. On average, visitors are collecting four pieces of content, and the number of content pieces collected ranged from zero to 172 pieces. Some learnings. Now, this is a mix of Google Analytics and visitor marketing research. We're very lucky we have a dedicated visitor marketing research team. And yeah, in a nutshell, uh, clear instructions with support. 
Visitors found scanning the card quite challenging. Many visitors initially pressed the card against the symbol itself rather than underneath. Other visitors, particularly children, enjoyed the activity of saving content to the card, but had little intention of viewing this content off-site. Whether, when the My Collection card box was actually found, visitors struggled to understand the words described as content and digital interactives. Some visitors expected scanning the card to bring up different information. We had no guides or visitors to help us, um, and this was located at the end of the chronology wall, as I've mentioned. So visitors often found that the My Collection card box towards the end of their visit. Visitors entered their email addresses also uh, to send themselves letters before finding the cards itself. Um, some children had also registered cards and to email addresses of their friends, uh, so they could send friend, <laughs> friends content as some kind of hilarious joke. <laughs> Minimising the steps involved, uh, we just have way too many steps in this process. And it's a cliche, I know, but the best processes are the simplest. Why would we get the visitor to place in the email address when we've already given them a unique code? Test and optimise, another obvious point, um, but it's not hard to test the concept even with paper prototyping before placing on the floor. We're very lucky with our visitors. Um, they are open. They're mostly keen to participate in helping with us. And finally, enable what visitors are already doing. Visitors are already collecting their own content. Uh, they're doing this with pictures, selfies, videos, etc. Rather than creating something bespoke, how can we enable visitors or students to connect with their stories and have their own inquiry with their own devices? And final slide from me about analytics. Um, so given that we didn't actually launch with analytics, that was a big learning in itself. So just to recap on that, it's important. <laughs> it's another way to gather insights, and it's pretty low cost. Um, if you don't know what to measure just yet, that's fine. Just place in a tag and keep working on the why. It's also bloody hard. Um, session views and Google Analytics on, for, for on-floor experiences just don't work. People walk away from screens mid-session. Uh, you have multiple people using a screen at once, which you can't measure. There's just some things that Google Analytics can't see, uh, which leads me to my next point, uh, that Google Analytics alone just isn't enough. Um, the hybrid approach that we took with using visitor marketing research and Google Analytics is key. So the data you're gathering is both quantitative and qualitative. If you don't have a research team, just observe on the floor. Even ask your visitors directly what they think. It's easy to get disconnected uh, from what people are actually doing. And once you've got the analytics, define which insights truly matter. Uh, we had an average time spent on screen of 1 minute 20 seconds for these interactives. And, but but you know, is this reflective of engaged users? What if we filtered out users that drop off under 5 seconds? This could be a good measure of our real users. Kia ora, Guy. Me again. Um, so just to try and summarize the range of digital experiences in the gallery, and in particular that collectible content element, which was something big that we were trying again. Um, did it work, the collectible content? And the answer is sort of. It needs to be simpler, as Guy touched on. Simpler than taking a photo of labels or content with your phone, because that's really easy. I do it all the time. If I don't have time to read something in an exhibition, take photos of the labels, read it on the train home. And last year, our exhibition team behind Volume, the music exhibition at the Auckland Museum, um, touched on their initial pilot with collectible content um, and stated rightly that there's got to be a bigger incentive to collect the content, which usually means making it more than just a label, a gig poster that you can personalise, a Spotify playlist, something that could only have been created in the exhibition and that visitors would likely want to share with their whānau. Um, we had a bit of a bigger struggle. Our aim was a little different. Um, to provide that bespoke content and primary source material to formal learners is definitely a much harder sell than putting your face on the cover of Rip It Up magazine. But it can work with structure and scaffolding. And what we've kind of figured out is a lot of that scaffolding actually needs to happen elsewhere in the visitor journey. It's prior to stepping into the gallery or even into the museum. It's pre-visit information via our educations and our bookings teams that actually lets teaching staff know that this offer exists. Um, this idea was entirely born through working with teachers. They see real value in the concept. It was often discussed in the early think tank sessions with Kate, who's here, um, with teachers. Um, the one thing we heard again and again was that they were really time poor when they come to the gallery. By the time they've got a busload of kids in, they've arrived, put their bags away, had morning tea, they're already against the clock and they're probably going to go to more galleries than just our one. So that's the good news. 
Collectible content for the purposes of fact-finding or researching school projects could be an invaluable tool in maximising the time students have to enjoy the full range of experiences that only the museum can provide. That's the combination of collection objects, stories, physical and digital interactives that fill our spaces. It's the museum point of difference. Um, we've said, you know, we can't compete with the video games that we're playing at home in terms of realism or keep in front of the internet for speed of information. But what we provide in galleries like this is what's tangible, such as the replica of a new recruit's kit that visitors can touch and explore. It's our collections representing what's real, objects such as our gas mask, which is a morbid point of fascination for formal learners, or the shaving kit, which stopped a piece of shrapnel from piercing a serviceman's heart. It's the unexpected digital games and new technologies that we put in our exhibitions. Sometimes it's a good old dress-up box and a selfie moment. Um, in terms of a cost-effective return on investment, you'd be hard-pushed to beat these. Um, the try-on greatcoats and lemon squeezers have been wildly popular with small kids and big kids alike. Um, and when we got talking about this more, we would have said we would love to have developed an AR experience um, around this, where perhaps you're seen in a different environment when you put the coat on. Um, and I think we're going to have a real renewed focus in trying to integrate physical objects that you can touch, feel, wear, and digital. And so to wrap up, I just wanted to end on this image. Um, earlier on, I sort of bashed the development of our virtual reality experience. After this project, I didn't think I'd ever want to put VR in a gallery again. It's massively resource intensive to produce. It's easily broken. And I was convinced that the technology moves faster than the museum ever could. So I was like, well, this is going to be really old hat by the time the audience um, it was intended for sees it. But I've been proven wrong, and it's massively popular with kids, um, usually if for no other reason than they hadn't ever used VR before. Um, this photo literally shows kids lining up to use it. It's our responsibility and our privilege to continue to provide this full raft of experiences for visitors to enjoy in our museums, and particularly as much as, impossible, as, much as possible, that includes new, exciting, and emerging technologies presented in an environment that visitors simply can't recreate at home. We want to provide the magic and excitement of using a new piece of technology for the first time, and so that's my new mission. I want to recreate for our younger visitors the feeling I had when I unwrapped my Nintendo 64 on Christmas morning in 1997. Thank you very much. I believe we have Questions at all? Can't see. Corner down. Looking for a microphone. <laughs> Can you give a general ballpark figure of how much it costs, say excluding your internal um, cost, but just the cost of the external um, providers? That was the question I knew I was going to get asked that I'm totally unprepared to answer, partly because I don't know the accumulative figure. Um, Tim, Tim might. Um, <laughs> um, and also because I, I didn't even ask permission if I could say, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it was part of a bigger raft of... Um, there were two galleries that were developed back-to-back -back simultaneously. Um, Pomo Mahara, the Memorial Discovery Centre, which is our new research space, and Pokanohi New Zealand at War, which is our space for school groups, as I've been saying. Um, and a lot of that was possible via uh, lottery grants and uh, World War 100 funding as well. But I'm sorry to dodge your question, yes, I don't many know. Millions. Many millions of dollars, I'm being told to say by the boss. Wasn't cheap. Yeah, wasn't cheap. Mm -hmm. Kia ora, and just um, wanting to ask if you guys considered going a little bit further with the collection cards and actually allowing the audience to add their own stories or add something to it, sort of like building on DNZ stories, I can say that because National Library, um, but something where they can actually add a narrative to the things that they collect themselves? Yeah, totally, and it was a big pain point for us that the one thing we were really lacking on was actually like a participatory moment. Um, a lot of the projects were front-loaded in terms of um, we wanted to include voices of younger people and what they think about the war today. So that comes through in so much other stuff that we haven't talked about today, such as films that we made and things like that. Um, and the participatory moment was really hard to include. But the original intent for the cards was very much to make them feel as though they were part of a journey. 
So we wanted to say, give them an embarkation card or a conscription letter or something that meant they're on a journey and then they sort of unlock pieces of the story as they went. The difficulty with that was um, the gallery is non-linear. There's three or four different entrances into the gallery and then you can just sort of scatter to the wind. We don't really have that narrative linear storytelling element that a structured exhibition would provide. Um, so yeah, we did talk about it a lot and it just became became harder and harder to achieve in the way we would have wanted. And through working with the teachers, it was quite obvious that the point for them was really, we need to take information away with us. So let us not write clipboards you know, on glass cases. Let us take the information home so we can work on it on projects later and enjoy running around and looking at the objects and stuff while they're in gallery. But yeah, there was something we would like to have achieved for sure. Online cenotaph. It's not in this gallery, but it's over the hall. You can use it there and contribute as much as you like. Yeah, sorry, I didn't didn't plug that. Hiya. Um, well you said it was a permanent exhibition. What's your definition of permanent? How long will it be there? Um, roughly 10 to 15 years was the figure, but very much a caveat of that was that the digital is likely to change, as will a lot of the objects. Part of the restoration of the gallery space meant opening up. Um, windows that had been sort of blocked over for a wee while. So there's a lot, there's a lot of natural light in there. So the objects are going to have a fairly quick rotation as well. Um, and the digital hopefully will follow that. So yeah, the structure of the gallery, the format with the timeline and stuff will remain, but the content and the experiences will change hopefully over the coming years. OK. Oh, one more. There's one more. There's one more. Um, you've uh, mentioned conversion rates. Um, I'd just be really keen to hear um, what that ratio is of people collecting content and then actually accessing it post-visit. Sorry, I missed that. Conversion one. rates of people collecting content um, on site and then revisiting it later, uh, you know, actual visits to their personalized mobile site that holds that content. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, that's data that was very difficult to find out um, because it was done in another bespoke system uh, where we couldn't like track over a cookie from one experience to the next. But we do have rough page views on actually the web platform and that they're quite low. So the upkeep of people actually getting to that web platform at the end of it is, is I'd say around 10% of people who are actually engaged and have had content, so yeah, relatively low. And that could be to do with the actual content itself. Um, we are kind of replicating what they have already seen. Like, yes, we are trying to streamline and make the experience more efficient, but they've already seen an image, they've already seen the text. Why, why are we showing them the same thing? So it could be another reason. Okay, okay thank you. Join me in thanking Ben and Guy.